If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them to Ephesians chapter 6. I'll give you a mini capsule of spiritual warfare because that's exactly what the Christian is involved in. It is a warfare that begins when we're born again and continues on in the life of every Christian. Verse 10. Find me, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the methods of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the spiritual darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly or high places of authority. The scripture tells you right here that spiritual warfare is first, foremost, primarily against the forces of darkness, against Satan, and against satanic powers. But that is not all that is involved in spiritual warfare. We first have to recognize the fact of spiritual warfare. Some people act as if there was nothing going on around them, and they were floating over Niagara Falls like a ping-pong ball, just bouncing along and nothing is affecting them. When something adverse occurs in their life, they never think, of it as being an attack of the devil. Instead, they just sort of say, well, that's life, that's the way things are, and they brush it off. Not to worry. God will get your attention. There is such a thing as spiritual conflict. We are born in conflict, in conflict against the world, in conflict against our carnal natures, in conflict against the devil. We will live in that conflict and we will die in that conflict unless Jesus Christ returns in our lifetime. The Bible clearly tells us there is such a thing as spiritual war. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. So there is war. The weapons of our warfare, it's our warfare, it's personal war. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. But they have divine power to tear down strongholds, to demolish arguments, and to literally decimate every proud thought that exalts itself against the throne of God, and to bring every thought captivity to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, there is a war going on. There is the fact of spiritual war. It's not against people. It's against the rulers of the darkness of this age, which manipulate people as if it were a great chessboard on earth, and the forces are arrayed against the Christian church. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, War the warfare. Uses the strongest word imaginable. Strategia, which is the Greek word for strategy. The strategy, the logistics of combat, polemics, war. So you can't escape the fact that the Christian is committed to spiritual warfare. War, that type of warfare, says Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. He says that anybody that is chosen by God to be a soldier, uses the term soldier, does not get entangled or encumbered with civilian pursuits. In other words... When God calls you into the church of Jesus Christ, you have enlisted in the army of God. You can truthfully sing onward Christian soldiers marching as to war because you are at war. Now, of course, you have an option. You can be dumb. You can say, I don't have any spiritual war. I think positively all the time. I don't have negative thoughts. I think only possibilities and the things that God has for me. There's no war around me. That's reminiscent of the Christian scientist in hell who sat by himself in a corner and said, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here. <laughs> but it never changes the fact. You're there. And you're in a spiritual war, whether you think so or not. And the whole world is blowing up around you, and you just can't sit there and say, nothing's happening. It is. 
And it will continue to happen. Because the moment you enlist in the army of God, you personally become a target. Would you make a note of that? When you enlist in the army of God, you personally become a target. No more Mr. Nice Guy. You are on the satanic hit list. And if you really are a Christian living and walking with Jesus Christ, they're coming after you. Now you say, but that's paranoia. Remember, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> it is not paranoid to be realistic. Jesus said, the God of this age, the ruler of this world or age is coming. He's nothing in me. Yeah, but the ruler of this age is coming, Dr. Barnhouse said, and he findeth plenty in you and me. There's residual evil in us to which Satan can appeal. And then he uses that to manipulate us and use us against each other and even against the church of Christ. Some of the worst damage done in the Christian church today is done by Christians who have yielded themselves without even recognizing it to Satan. And what happens? Satan uses them to disrupt the body of Christ. They're all over the place. Disruptors of the kingdom of God and resistors of those that are standing for the kingdom of God. So, there is a fact of enlistment. You are in the army of God. If you will not fight in the army of God, then the Lord will discipline you until you get to the place where you will. Because you will get so many attacks that you will eventually have to do something. That's a warning. It's also biblical theology. You're in the middle of a war. People who walk around in the middle of a war acting as if there was no war are called casualties. Can you make a note of that? People who walk around in the middle of a war acting as if there was no war are called casualties. And there are people all over the landscape scattered around, ineffective in their Christian lives, neutralized in their Christian witness, paralyzed in their Christian activities, simply because they don't realize they're a casualty. And they have got to be restored by God so they can get back into the battle. It's no accident that the fact of warfare is biblical theology. Now you're probably sitting there saying, well, you've been doing this for 35 years. I mean, that's second nature to you. I don't understand this. Permit me to say there was a time when I didn't understand it either. And I was a casualty. And then the Lord showed me, "Why, right, George, you have to do something. You can't just lay around on the battlefield moaning and groaning. You've got to get up and get back into the fight. It's like when you're playing football. I'll never forget when I went out for football. Every bone of my body ached. Every muscle felt like I was going to die. First I thought I'd die, then I was afraid I wouldn't. It was awful. I never had such rigorous conditioning for varsity football. We ran and ran and ran and ran with heavy equipment on us. I thought we were going to drop dead. And we did calisthenics until we ached. It was miserable. But six or eight weeks later, you were in great shape, lean and mean, and you felt like you could get something done. I'll never forget the first scrimmage I was in. The quarterback clipped me. You know what clip is? Clip is when you don't see it coming. I was a tackle. I was going in to tackle the guy that had the ball, I thought. But the quarterback was over on my left. And as soon as I passed him, he threw a body block on me. And he hit me right across my lower back. I'm still feeling it. That's 40 years ago. And he knocked me flat. And all the wind out of me. I'm laying there. What happened? What happened? Now, I had a choice to make. I could lay there. What happened? Or I could say... Yeah. 
and get up and look for that quarterback. And the next time he carried the ball, did I get him? He came through my tackle slot and I lifted him right off his feet into the air and came right down on top of him with all my 200 pounds and my shoulder uh, pad right in his middle. And he went... (laughs) Now, at football tactics, what do you do when you get knocked out? You get up. What do you do when the wind is knocked out of you? Breathe again. What do you do when you can't fight anymore? Fight more. And God says, you learn it in football. You learn it in basic training in the army. God knows you learn it there. You learn it in every facet of life. How come you can't learn it in spiritual combat? You don't have to lay around the battlefield like so much litter. You can get up and fight the good fight of faith. So, the fact. We are in a spiritual war. It's not going to go away. Two, you are in the army of God. And I am, we're supposed to fight. We're supposed to fight with the weapons of spiritual warfare. With the arguments of God, with the text of Scripture, with the power of the Spirit. Secondly, who are we fighting? The Bible says, very clearly, we are fighting satanic power. Secondly, we are fighting worldly dominion. And thirdly, we are fighting our carnal nature. Let me document it. Ephesians 6, 12. We are fighting not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual rulers of darkness in this age. That's the devil and his demons. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, stalks about as a roaring lion. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Resist the devil, says James, and he will what? I didn't hear you. He will flee from you. But you've got to resist. And the only way to resist is by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, and getting dressed for combat. Okay. The foes are Satan and demonic powers. Secondly, the foes involve the world system. James 4, 1 to 4. You are involved, says James, in a world system of conflict which has zeroed in on you. Read the references later today. James 4, verses 1 to 4. And you are at war with the flesh. 1 Peter 4, 1 to 4. If you don't know you're at war with the flesh, you are really in trouble. You're like the guy who's talking about sleeping with his girlfriend to find out if they're compatible. You have jumped from the frying pan into the fire. So, our foes are the devil... Demonic power, the desires of the flesh, and the pressure of the world. If you do not know the nature of your enemy and you do not know who your foes are, you can't fight. You believe that? It's true. If you don't know where it's coming from, you can't do anything about it. If you know who the people are, you don't know what the forces are, you can't combat them. It's only when you know and you realize what you're up against that you can effectively stand against them. And then, what must you do in spiritual warfare to really fight a good fight of faith? That's a logical question. Ephesians 6.18 gives you the answer. Praying always in the Spirit. Asking the Spirit of God to enable you to effectively recognize your enemies and deal with them. Praying always in the Spirit. Then, you must get into the best possible spiritual condition to fight the battle. 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 10. Endure hardness or conditioning as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you're going to be a soldier, get in shape. You can't go out and fight hand-to-hand combat when you're loaded with flab. If you're sitting on your surpluses, the enemy is going to have you for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You've got to go out there and get the suet off your carcass. You've got to get the muscle hard. The reflexes geared up. You've got to be able to respond. 
And you can't respond in physical combat, you die. It's as simple as that. You must respond in spiritual combat, or you are spiritually wounded and you lay around moaning and groaning about all the things that have happened to you. You not only endure hardness, but you are sober and vigilant. The word sober means alert. There's no such thing as a sleepy, successful soldier. No such thing as a sleepy, successful soldier. If you're sleepy, you will not be successful. If you're sleepy on guard duty, you won't have to worry about the enemy. Your own side will shoot you. Sleepy soldiers who are not alert have one thing in common. They're dead. Share one common factor. They're dead. So God said, you want to fight spiritual war? Be alert. Secondly, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is stalking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's only one way to turn that lion into a pussycat. That's to resist him steadfast in the faith of Christ. And that's why there's so many Christians who are weak and ineffective. They have not combated the enemy. They have not fought back as servants of God. So if you're going to be an effective Christian, you've got to recognize the fact of spiritual warfare. You've got to recognize the foes in spiritual warfare. You've got to recognize the need for training and conditioning in spiritual warfare. And the ultimate training is get dressed for battle. Ephesians 6. Nobody goes out to war in their underwear. You don't. You go out with 30 or 40 pounds of equipment. You have to. You have to be dressed for combat. There are Christians running around today in their spiritual BVDs trying to conduct spiritual warfare against the enemy. And they don't understand why the flaming arrows of the wicked one are sticking out of their spiritual derrieres. It's very easy. They're not equipped. You get equipped by studying and showing yourself approved by God, a workman who doesn't need to blush with embarrassment, rightly interpreting the word of truth. Ignorance of the Bible is ignorance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ignorance of Christ is ignorance of your own defense. Because you can't defend yourself unless you're walking in the light with Him. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6. I began there. I'll end there. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the methods of the devil. Okay? You can stand against Satan. You can be victorious. You can know the final conquest. And the final conquest in spiritual warfare is something God has promised us in the Lord Jesus. He said, avoid distraction. 2 Timothy 2.4 Don't let anything get in the way of your focal point of concentration. What is your focal point of concentration? Survival. A soldier must survive. General Patton said it far more eloquently than I could ever say it in World War II, but I will not use his language. The general said, you don't win wars by dying for your country. You win wars by getting the other guy to die for his country. Only those weren't his exact words. <laughs> now, that's common sense. If you want to be victorious, you've got to have God's power to conquer. How do you get it? You get the power of God to conquer by a very simple biblical method which most people are dead on determined to ignore. Because it's so simple. Do you think that spiritual warfare and the ultimate victory are hard? No. The promise of God is the simplest thing in the world to accept. And one of the most difficult for mankind. Because we're always trying to do something for ourselves. We're always trying to win the battle by ourselves. The Lord says, I got news for you. I have the ultimate solution. You ready? Here it is. Remember you heard it here first. The final conquest is 1 John 5, 4 and 5. This is the victory that overcomes the world. 
Got it? The word overcome means conquer. This is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. And you say, well, I mean, that's something new and startling. It is when you put it in its proper context. What is faith? Faith, Hebrews 11.1, 1, is being sure of what you hope for. And absolutely certain of what you cannot see. Good grief. Think about that for a second. Sure of what you hope for? Certain of what you can't see? How in the world do you get to that state? You don't. Not by yourself. You can't ever get to the state of being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see unless God gives you the measure of faith. Because God gives the measure of faith to every person as it pleases Him. Not in proportion to your efforts, but as it pleases Him. Now the Lord Jesus gave us the ultimate reduction of faith. And this is the key. John 16, 33. Be of good cheer. I have conquered the world. Do you believe that? Be, uh, I'll put it in modern language. Cheer up! I have conquered everything. That is what John is talking about in 1 John chapter 5. Christ defeated Satan on the cross. He defeated him in the glory of the resurrection. And he imparts that capacity of conquest to your life and to my life every single day that we are willing to believe Him. And if you can get up in the morning and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you have conquered the world. Conquer today through me. I believe you. Give me victory. Take away my doubts. Take away my fears. Give to me the measure of faith. That is necessary for me to survive today. Never mind tomorrow. Never mind next week. Never mind next year. You may not be here. Lord Jesus, today, conquer. Wake up and say, in you, I have my trust. I believe you have conquered the world. Conquer today through me. Give me the faith to trust you today. Give me the faith to overcome Satan today. Give me the faith to overcome the forces of darkness today. Give me the victory over the world. And that victory is a gift from you. Give it to me today, Lord. And I'll tell you something wonderful. I've been fighting this spiritual battle since 1944. And I can tell you with absolute certainty and surety, with lots of experience... That is the key to spiritual conquest. The acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And now how do you do that? Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation. It's a gift. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's a gift. Put on the belt of truth. It's a gift. Put on the readiness to preach the gospel. It's a gift. Take the shield of faith. It's a gift. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's a gift. Take God's gifts for God's conquest. And then get dressed for battle. Every single piece of armor in Ephesians chapter 6 is for the front of your body. There isn't one single piece for your rear end. You know why? Because soldiers do not turn around in the middle of combat. They go forward. And the reason why Christians become ineffective and weak and drained and they litter the battlefield and get in everybody's way is because in the midst of conflict and combat, they weren't believing Jesus Christ. And they turned around and they ran away. And the flaming arrows of the wicked one have lodged in their spiritual rumps. And there's only one way that you're going to get your strength back. 
Get down on your knees and confess your sin and ask Jesus Christ to pull the arrows out of your carcass. And then affirm what Christ has told you. Be of good cheer. I have conquered the world. And this is the victory that you've got. This is your conquest. Believe me. And if you believe me, and if you seize upon it with faith, God's going to bless you out of your socks. He's going to give you victory. And He's going to lead you in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. When I first became a Christian, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I knew my catechism. I knew my religion. I didn't know much at all about Scripture. But I did know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I used to wake up every morning in prep school, a new Christian with a brand new Bible, not knowing one end of the book from the other. And the first thing that would come out of my mouth in the morning, and my wife can tell you I can't carry a tune in a bucket, was a hymn. This was the hymn. When morning gilds the sky, my heart awakening cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. Alike at work or prayer, to Jesus I repair, may Jesus Christ be praised. Be this while life is mine, my canticle divine, may Jesus Christ be praised. Victory is in the one who is being praised. Cheer up. I have conquered the world. That's our victory. Victory over spiritual warfare. Face the fact that it's there. Face the foes that represent it. Face the need to get yourself in spiritual condition by the study of the Word of God and submission to the Holy Spirit and by believing Jesus Christ. The victory is ours. And then, the final conquest is your recognition that the Lord Jesus Christ is the source of faith. Author, finisher of faith. Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last. Cheer up. I have conquered the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith.